Well, good morning, everybody, and welcome to our service at Peniston Community Church. Uh, it's good to be together in the church for a few of us, and uh, for those of you watching the recording later, I hope you're blessed by uh, the worship and by uh, the word that Howard is going to be bringing us shortly. So uh, we're looking forward to that. But we're going to worship God together um, in song, so I hope you'll join in with us and give glory to God. next song might be quite a new one for uh, many of us, but it sings of Jesus and his words, Father, not my will, but yours be done. So if you uh, want to just look at the words as I play part of it through and then we'll, we'll sing. that God in Hebrews is I 
what wondrous faith to bear that cross, to bear my sin, what wondrous love, my hope was sure, that my Savior prayed, Father, not my will, to yours be done. When I am lost, when Traded for this sinner, my 
times in our worship. It's, um, it's good to learn a new song, new words to give expression to our hearts. And um, this song, I think, we haven't sung as a church before, so I thought it would be a good time to do it whilst we're recording it, so that uh, those of you who don't know it can listen to it again if you like it. Um, and so that we can get it wrong publicly. And so that we can <laughs> get it wrong, which could happen. Um, but we're going to sing um, our final song for this morning. Um, Mine are days that God has numbered, I was made to walk with him. Yet I look for worldly treasure and forsake the King of Kings. Mine is hope in my Redeemer, though I fall, his love is sure. For Christ has paid for every failing, I am his forevermore. Thank you that the promises you've made, many of them have come to pass. We thank you that you have saved us. We thank you that you died on a cross for us. But we thank you that you have more. And your promises 
are for our salvation. Your promises are for our lives, but our promises are for our future with you. We thank you that you've made a place for us, that you give a promise that we will walk beside you. Amen. Normally at this point, I ask the congregation if they'd like to sit down. But <laughs> as we're not really... As we've not really been able to stand and sing as we normally would, um, we are already sitting down. Um, notices for today, we have to do notices. So on Tuesday, I think we'll be uh, doing another session of house group. And, um, and I think Sheila will be sharing with the house group leaders uh, the, uh, the next step in our uh, look at Paul's letter to the church in Philippi. Um, and, uh, and thank you to everyone who's taking part in that. Thank you also to Paul, who was doing the words behind the scene there, and to Teresa for um, helping me lead us in worship. Uh, it's a great pleasure to welcome Howard again. Last time you came, I wasn't here, um, so it's very kind of you to, uh, to come back again. And uh, so in a socially distant way, uh, now might be a good time for me to invite you to um, stand behind the screen and to share with us. Um, and then I will uh, pray for us and for you, if I may. And then uh, uh, we'll look forward to your word. So, <laughs> so. It's hard to know where to stand, so not to block people. You're kind of right in a reflection there, so I might have to just adjust the camera or something. But we'll we'll find a way. Um, I've, uh, I've been asked to speak in a church once where the preacher said, oh, I have a very open pulpit, I'll let anyone preach there, which is presumably why he asked me. Um, and we don't. I'm really very careful about who we have uh, preaching here because I think that's appropriate. And so um, it is, um, uh, we preach amongst ourselves. Uh, we have some guests that are uh, friends of the church, many of whom I've known for many years. Um, but a testament to you, Howard, even though um, we only, we've only met once or twice briefly mm. and I haven't heard you preach, I can trust you to preach because I know what you've produced in your life in Cat <laughs> and in the family that you have brought and, uh, mm. and is part of us and, and in knowing Cat, just to, uh, when uh, we thought of Cat's father might preach, we can trust you to preach because of the Thank person you. that Cat is and so we're grateful. Um, we pray that the words of your mouth and the meditations of all our hearts will be pleasing and acceptable in God's sight. Mm. And we look forward to your word. Thank you. Uh, thank you uh, for your kind words uh, and for the invitation to be here. It's really good to do that. Um, I have done some preaching during lockdown uh, on video um, for one or two of the churches in the Loughborough area. But it's lovely to be in church. I've not been in church for a very long time so it's really good to be here and thank you for that invitation let's just pray for a second before we begin father we thank you for your word for all that it means to us and we pray now that your spirit might come and move amongst us and open up that word not just through the words that come through my mouth but through your spirit working in our hearts and our minds. May we hear you speaking to us, Father, in very clear tones that will not only encourage us, but actually build us up in this most holy faith. And we ask it in Jesus' name. Amen. The book of the Revelation of John, and chapter 2, uh, says this. To the angel of the church in Ephesus write, These are the words of him who holds the seven stars in his right hand and walks among the seven golden lampstands. I know your deeds, your hard work, and your perseverance. I know that you cannot tolerate wicked men, that you have tested those who claim to be apostles but are not, and have found them false. You have persevered and have endured hardships for my name and have not grown weary. 
yet I hold this against you. You have forsaken your first love. Remember the height from which you have fallen. Repent and do the things you did at first. If you do not repent, I will come to you and remove your lampstand from its place. But you have this in your favor. You hate the practices of the Nicolaitans, which I also hate. He who has an ear, let him hear what the Spirit says to the churches. To him who overcomes, I will give the right to eat from the tree of life, which is in the paradise of God. I look back to my childhood and try to think of those things that I either loved or hated at that time. And one of the things that always stands clearly in my mind is that I hated Brussels sprouts. Um, it was because we invariably had them on a Monday with the cold meat left over from Sunday. Uh, and my mum <clears throat> had a tendency to overcook Brussels sprouts. And she was of the old school where you put a dose of soda in with them. So they were green, deep green. And they looked revolting. And as far as I was concerned, they tasted revolting. And that memory sort of sits in my heart and my mind. But then I thought, in more recent times... And because my wife was a good cook, Brussels sprouts have taken on a whole new flavor and meaning. And I love them. I actually love them. And what was hate has turned to love. Okay. Now, you may have things like that or vice versa, things which you loved and now hate. And what causes those changes? And uh, are we in control when those changes take place. 1 Chronicles 9 says this, the people of Judah were taken captive to Babylon because of their unfaithfulness. They stopped loving God and consequently suffered accordingly. And there they remained in captivity those 70 plus years until they had learned to love God again. In Psalm 137, we read of their sort of anguish at the time of their captivity as they say, by the rivers of Babylon we sat and wept when we remembered Zion. But they didn't remember Zion because of God at that point. They remembered God... Zion because of the temple, because the temple was the center of worship and they hadn't got that anymore, and therefore they felt deprived. But God himself was still not, at that moment in time, in their hearts and in their lives. I think it took some considerable time before they began to realize just how much they needed God and how much they had left him out of everything uh, that they had done. You remember when um, Nehemiah takes them back to the city of Jerusalem, rebuilds the walls, and Ezra comes out and stands in this very high pulpit. I'm glad that's all gone. Um, and <laughs> he preached the word of God to them by reading the word of God, and suddenly they realized just how much they were missing God and the center of their lives. I don't think they realized just how much God loved his chosen people uh, and how deep was that love for them and how he longed for them to bring it back to him. And so throughout the Old Testament, we see this people of God, these children, as he calls them, wandering in and out of love with God, time after time after time. Uh, and not staying firmly fixed. And very often, throughout it, they believe that it's God who has abandoned them and given up on them. But it's not. It's they who have given up on God. 
And then we come to this reading in the Revelation. I was often asked as the pastor of a church, why don't you preach on the Revelation? And I said to them, I'll preach on the first two or three chapters, and thereafter you'll have to work at it yourself. <laughs> um, because no matter who you are as a preacher, you're going to have one particular thought in the way that you look at the Revelation, and that's bound to be two-thirds of your congregation going off in two other directions. Dangerous territory. So I avoided that. But these uh, first few verses, I'm happy to preach uh, from. Uh, and so we find Jesus, through vision, speaking to John, the beloved, and revealing the requirements that he has, what Jesus has, for these seven churches of the Asia Triangle, as it were. And the first one, of course, is, is Ephesus. Uh, it was a port of some importance uh, in the Roman Empire. It was a large city for its day. It was at the crossroads of many of the trade routes at that time. It was therefore a very much a commercial place, but it was also a place where there was a temple uh, to the pagan god Diana, a vast uh, temple. Paul establishes a church there and uh, a center for evangelization because it's from there he goes out to teach in other places. It's from there that others go out to preach and teach. When Paul uh, writes to the church at Ephesus in AD 60 from his prison cell, he does so not with complaints about the doctrines of ethics, but rather always to encourage the expansion of the gospel. Uh, Chapter 1 of, uh, of that says, For this reason, ever since I heard about your faith in the Lord Jesus and your love for all the saints, I have not stopped giving thanks for you. Hmm? It'd be like somebody like Billy Graham, um, you know, speaking about us here in Peniston and saying, I've not stopped giving thanks to God for you and your work in the district. It was a church of great note, uh, and John in the Revelation notes the words of Jesus about them. I know your deeds and your hard work. The church uh, would have been hard-pressed to maintain their faith in Jesus Christ uh, because at the time of writing, Gnosticism was rampant. Now, some of you may and some of you may not know uh, what Gnosticism is, but basically the people who were leading the Gnostics were saying, well, Jesus Christ is actually the first step on the ladder to heaven. What you need after that is knowledge. And knowledge is all important. If you've got knowledge, then you will ascend. It wasn't that Jesus was the be-all and end-all of Christian thinking and theology. They were adding much more. Uh, and you needed to attain this knowledge because if you didn't, you weren't going to heaven. And, and these philosophies were taught uh, at the time by a man called Serdo uh, and a man called Marcion. And they were well respected, but nonetheless totally wrong in what they were saying. They also believed that the God of the Old Testament was of no consequence whatsoever. Cut it out. Forget about it. There are lots of Christians who think like that today. How can you reconcile the God of the Old Testament with the God of the New? It doesn't seem to be the same guy. You know? So let's cut it out. But actually, if you take away the Old Testament, there is nothing to base that new faith and that new hope upon. Okay. And so Ephesus battled uh, with those ideas as they ministered uh, to this very pagan crossroads town. So I stopped there and said to myself, well, what about us? I'll count it myself as us 
here in Peniston. Uh, what elements, ideas, practices are we battling against in order to maintain the faith? Or perhaps we've ensconced ourselves here in the building and become a capsule of faith and are avoiding the challenges of today's Gnosticisms. And knowledge and understanding are right in the midst of all that we believe in. I dare say that most of you, even those at home, have got your phone very handy to you. And somebody says something to you, and you're immediately on to Google. What does it say? I, I've just come back from 10 days with my other daughter and her husband. Those phones, those two phones, were in their hands 99.9% .9 of the time. And every time I opened my mouth to say something, they were just checking to make sure that I was right. <laughs> you know, trust your dad. Is, is what I've always believed in, but, you know, there we go. Um, <laughs> and the truth is that we are battling against those things, and that's today's Gnosticism. As I was thinking about that, I thought about a poem um, that was written by William uh, Ernest Henley's. Now, I was taught this as a song, and it's called Invictus. And the first verse says, Out of the night that covers me, black as the pit from pole to pole, I thank whatever gods may be for my unconquerable soul. And the last verse says, It matters not how strong the gate, how charged with punishment the scroll. I am the master of my fate. I am the captain of my soul. And those two things, I think, sum up much of the sort of Gnosticism that we have around us. I am the master of my fate. I am the captain of my soul. And that, I believe, is the challenge to our faith and our belief and our work and witness as people of Jesus Christ. Now, we find that the church at Ephesus is commended for the way uh, they would not tolerate men and women uh, who were wicked. And they got rid of them. I wonder how we would react today to someone who we thought was not quite what they might be. Would we speak with them? Would we challenge them with the gospel? Or would we just leave them? How easy it is to overlook the things that are difficult. The things that are not really acceptable to God, but actually we're scared to challenge that because we might get a reputation of being too sanctimonious or something similar. Okay? And, and so we allow those things to fester within our churches. And then before long, we find ourselves with breakups in our churches and the communities are no longer whole and in love with Jesus. But not so in Ephesus. Wickedness was rooted out, dealt with firmly, but with grace to win the erring souls back to the kingdom. Furthermore, they've been attacked, it tells us, by false apostles. The term apostle means one sent with a message of truth. But many of these had not necessarily been sent. They'd simply come because they thought they'd got something special to share with the church. So they turned up and they spouted out their reasonings. And it was quite endangering uh, to the church. Again, soon they were cleared out, uh, and there was new hope. They were not led astray at Ephesus, whereas some of the other churches in that triangle were. And then it tells us they endured hardships. I don't know what they were. I don't think we, we ever will know truly what the hardships were that the Ephesus church endured, but nonetheless, 
they endured them, and they remained faithful to Christ, to Paul's teachings, uh, and to the fellowship of believers. I think they were held up as the near-perfect Christian church. Indeed, one for us uh, to emulate, if only we weren't so critical uh, and so self-righteous as churches are today. And despite it all, John reveals that they had not grown weary. It seems to me that that's one of the biggest problems in our churches, that we grow weary. People stay in certain tasks within the church too long uh, and then won't let go of them. Uh, and they grow weary in it and therefore the work fades within that area. Uh, and people grow weary because their lives are busy and they're totally challenged and we really need to be very careful who we ask uh, to do work within the church. You know, I, I marvel at some of you because I hear news um, and it's always gilded beautifully, I might add. Um, <laughs> you're right, you can stay for a while. Um, uh, and I hear of the work that you do in your lives and yet are still strong and unwearied by the life and witness of the church. And that, I think, is wonderful. And there are people who say, well, if I don't do this job, who will? Well, the answer is you can only find out when you retire, you know, so please do. Um, and... <laughs> <laughs> And, you know, I've been through all those experiences uh, within uh, the three churches in which I have ministered and worked. I've recently been reading a book. <coughs> it's a novel, actually, called So You Don't Want to Go to Church Anymore by a man called uh, Jake Colson. It's actually a fictional work, um, and... Jake doesn't really exist. But the two people who've written the book are both pastors of two big churches in America. And they suddenly realized that they needed to address a situation in the church. And the, ch the, the uh, weariness of the church was the thing that they wanted to address. And so Jake, in the story, is an assistant pastor who, <clears throat> having had a really good friendship with the pastor, suddenly finds that's not working anymore. <clears throat> Excuse me. And he finds that he's wearied by all the things that he's required to do. And there's a man in the book called John, who you're given the impression could have actually been a reincarnation of the Apostle John, who comes back and just has conversations with Jake, 13 conversations within the book, and just sort of points him in the right direction of actually not worrying about being tired or of being in the church even, but rather of getting back to loving Jesus. And that brings me back to the text, which says, Yet I hold this against you. You have forsaken your first love. What first love? The girl with the beautiful eyes that you fell in love with, fellas? Or, ladies, the guy who was just amazing to look at? <laughs> you understand, don't you? <clears throat> the person, perhaps, we married. Uh, the church, perhaps, is a first love, where we were baptized and where we first met Jesus. But none of those should be our first love. Our first love surely should be Jesus. Do you remember when you first met with Jesus? Whatever that experience was, maybe you were reading the scriptures, maybe there was some guy who was preaching. Um, my wife, Hillary, uh, had her experience of that in a Billy Graham rally, which was televised to... Nottingham Ice Rink before Torval and Dean arrived there. Um, <laughs> uh, and when it was 
quite tatty, to be quite honest. Uh, and I was there, I saw her. And, and I know how she was at that time. Uh, and that was her first love. M maybe you met with Jesus quietly, privately, on your own. Uh, a lady called uh, Ruth Dobshina, Jewish lady who had escaped uh, the Nazi regime, was living in a, an attic in Scotland, found a Bible. She'd only ever read the Old Testament before because she was Jewish, uh, and then discovered the New Testament and Jesus and fell in love with him uh, and spent the rest of her life uh, working uh, for him. I had the privilege of meeting her a couple of times. Uh, she was an amazing lady. So what was it like for you, that first love, that glow within of being forgiven as a sinner, the joy of knowing that your life was eternally in the hands of Jesus Christ in heaven, that you had a redeemer and a savior who loved you with his whole being and would have died for you on the cross of Calvary had you been the only person around. How amazing is that love? The dizzy heights, if you like, of being loved and in love with Jesus. In 1 John chapter 3, verse 16, and I've often said to my congregations, Look at any 3.16 in the scriptures and you'll find special verses there. Don't know how that works out, but it does. And this is one of them. This is how we know what love is. Jesus Christ laid down his life for us. What amazing love uh, this is. How could we not love him in thankfulness for all that he has given us in the way of salvation and hope eternal? But what happened in Ephesus? Surely all they'd achieved and all the passion they'd put into the work and witness that they'd got, surely they loved Christ. But apparently not. And what do we see around us in our churches today? Do we see that sort of passion into the jobs that are available, the work and the witness that we talk about? But how much of that is actually based on loving Christ rather than fulfilling purposes? They had very good reports, did Ephesus. Our churches very often have wonderful reports. Oh, you ought to go to such and such a church. It's fabulous, you know. The worship is amazing. Um, the preaching, whoa, absolutely stunning. But is there love? Is there love for Christ? Yet I hold this against you. You have forsaken your first love. In all that they labored for, in all that they planned for, in all that they had become, they were lacking the important sole purpose of their very existence. Jesus. I've been to one church where they have printed on the wall behind the preacher, Jesus, first and last. And actually, that's a good reminder. Uh, and I know at one point I used to have it on my lectern in front of me, just to remind me, you know, what I was doing. It wasn't about preaching a good sermon. It was about telling people my love for Jesus and how they too could love him. I suppose we could go back and evaluate uh, individuals' uh, efforts and labors, and we'd probably find that various people have poured their love of Jesus into those works, and it's been their own way of sharing their love for Jesus. However, overall, sadly, I feel that the church has become an institution, an organization, uh, with goals and purposes rather than with love on the agenda. Isn't it true that in our churches today, we too set our goals and our purposes 
uh, perhaps uh, even taking our lead um, from Scripture, like in Matthew, where Jesus says, Therefore, go into all the world and make disciples of all nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Spirit and teaching them all things. Maybe we've made that our goal, the baptizing, the teaching. But have we been teaching love? Now, as a Baptist minister, that uh, passage of Scripture has been a guiding light for me. Uh, I've tried to fulfill that, and I've been privileged and honored uh, in the number of baptisms that I have uh, taken over the years, um, even to the privilege of baptizing both my two daughters, which was great, although she, Catherine nearly didn't survive, because on that day, the water had not got heated, had it? It was freezing cold, and I baptized eight people that day, and I couldn't feel anything from the waist down. Um, but we survived, didn't we? Uh, and, and God was good to us. But in uh, this sort of sense, where are we with Jesus? Is he the very center of all that we have and share together? It's this personal encounter that must live within us and glow from within in order for us to win other souls. One man once said to me, what is it that you've got that I haven't? And I was privileged to be able to explain to him that it wasn't anything I'd got, but the person who lived within. What a wonderful moment that was. I remember the, the moment that I uh, fell in love with Hillary, my wife. The moment I looked into her eyes and saw love. Uh, then, from that moment on, I was totally hooked. Uh, and nothing ever stopped my mind from recalling that moment. Nor does it still. Even the dreadful cancers that she suffered, even the stroke that she had... Nothing ever took away that lovely moment. And so it should be with Jesus. But is it? For me, yes, there is that moment. I do know that moment, that amazing moment when I met with Jesus and Jesus became my Lord and my Savior. But how many of us in our communities, in our churches, remember that how many of us ever speak of that and share it with someone else how many of us actually have jesus as our first love rather than the church without that first love our churches will not grow they will remain static <coughs> or in the case of many Baptist churches, they will simply die. You know, I go to a church at the moment where 80% of us are 70 plus. Well, you know, we might have 30 years if we're lucky. Can't imagine myself living that long, but you know, who knows? Um, <clears throat> and uh, the church is not bringing any other folks in and they don't have to be young people they just are not attracting other people because they've forgotten their first love repeat and do the things you did at first if you do not repent i will come to you and remove your lampstand from its place in other words god will remove his spirit from within us if we don't love jesus as a first priority then our light will be removed and we will find ourselves in darkness and without the king of kings and the lord of lords and the lord of light and hope 
lost and without purpose. Now, I said to Catherine, I'm going to do something. And she said, well, have you asked Duffrey? And I said, no, because once I'm at the pulpit, he'll have a hard job stopping me. (laughs) 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 And that is that I've got this song, which is a Billy Graham song, and it was sung by George Beverly Shea and written by him as well. And I think it sums up much of what I are trying to be to say. I will move slightly from the microphone because I don't want to knock you all out. <coughs> and it goes like this. I'd rather have Jesus than silver or gold. I'd rather be his than have riches untold. I'd rather have Jesus than houses or land. I'd rather be led by his nail-pierced hand than to be the king of a lost domain and be held in Dresden's dead stray. I'd rather have Jesus than anything this world affords today. I'd rather have Jesus than men's applause. I'd rather be faithful to his dear cause. I'd rather have Jesus than worldwide fame. I'd rather be true to his holy name than to be the king of a vast domain and be held in sin's dread sway. I'd rather have Jesus than anything this world affords today. He's fairer than lilies of rarest bloom. He's sweeter than honey from out the comb. He's all that my hungering spirit needs. I'd rather have Jesus and let him lead than to be the king of a vast domain and be held in sin's dread sway. I'd rather have Jesus than anything this world affords today. Let's just pray. Father, may those words be true in all of our lives. We'd rather have Jesus than anything this world affords today. By your spirit, keep us close to him, we pray, and for his name's sake. Amen. So thank you very much. Uh, Thank you, Howard, for that challenge to keep Jesus at the center. It's great to be reminded. We should never forget it is all about him. So uh, thank you all to those of you who are here. Uh, Thank you to those who are uh, watching the recording. Pray that you'll be blessed. 
um, uh, today and that we will be able to gather um, in this building, uh, but it looks like that's still a little way off before we can do that uh, as we used to. Uh, but we take this opportunity to thank you for joining us and watching the video and uh, look forward to being with you again soon.